going to start with some words spoken by Patrick Geddes, more about him later, by leaves we live, which is something he said in a lecture in 1919. And for me, I've always found those to be an inspiring source of <coughs> understanding about the world. And the purpose of my talk, as I presented, is going to be just to remind us that it wasn't just true in 1919 when Patrick Geddes said it, by leaves we will always live. They are at the root of everything. I've just realized you can't have a root in a leaf of everything. <laughs> but um, I'm a botanist, so we'll have to understand that. Um, I'm hoping that um, most of you might have heard of Patrick Geddes and taking inspiration from earlier on. Uh, if you have, could you do that? <laughs> and if you haven't, could you do that? There was absolutely no sense to that, but luckily, <laughs> two different sets of people were doing things with their arms. See, I've learned. <laughs> well, Patrick Geddes was an amazing uh, person. He's well known, much written about him as a city planner and as an educator, but first and foremost, he was actually a botanist and um, mostly at the University of Dundee, but he worked for two years at the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh, and that's where he proposed to his future wife, Anna Morton, and that's where he undoubtedly would have been the director in 1888, had it not been for one of Scotland's botanical geniuses being the other candidate, uh, Isaac Bailey Balfour, slightly beat him to it. But um, I'm going to show you two of his quotations. Uh, this is the first, and um, I just will then unpack these words and give you some meaning about them. How many people think twice about a leaf? Yet the leaf is the chief product and phenomenon of life. This is a green world with animals comparatively few and small and all dependent on the leaves. And to me, that in a very concise poetic form is the ecology of planet Earth explained. What I'm going to do going on from that as a jumping off point is to go into the ancient history of our planet and turn later to the future of it. So we are here and this is our home in a view that Patrick Geddes couldn't have seen and indeed probably could never even have imagined that that's what planet Earth would look like. And of course, life got started in these oceans here. Um, four and a half billion years old, the planet, three and a half billion years ago, life began in the, uh, in the oceans, breaking down the bonds between inorganic uh, elements in the environment. And for me, that takes me right back to Polly's presentation this morning with all of those bonds whizzing around. But in a relatively short space of time, some forms of early life worked out a really clever trick of harnessing the energy of the sun and using abundant ingredients to, to make their energy. And that trick, uh, photosynthesis, started in blue-green algae or cyanobacteria. This one obviously isn't millions of years old, they're still with us, but here's one of them as we find them in the Earth today. And what they're able to do through photosynthesis is take carbon dioxide and water, extremely abundant things, and convert them effectively into sugars and oxygen, or you could say into food and breathable air. So they began doing that billions of years ago, and then around about 2.5 billion years ago, the productivity of oxygen was so much that it couldn't just be mopped up in the oceans anymore, and it began to leak out into the atmosphere. So that it built up and built up, and by one billion years ago, oxygen in the atmosphere formed the ozone layer, which actually protects us from radiation coming in from space. And that set the stage for life to move on to land. So some really important consequences of photosynthesis. Um, that event, when it evolved onto land, was called the Great Oxygenation Event, uh, placed approximately a two and a half billion years ago. And if Edinburgh International Science Festival had been around, you can bet they'd have been there, uh, you'd have been able to see it for yourself. But you couldn't, I'm afraid. We would actually have starved to death in the early Earth. Uh, nothing to breathe, nothing to eat. Today in the planet, photosynthesis still continues mainly in the oceans, um, especially in planktonic things like these diatoms. At least 50% of all photosynthesis is in the oceans. And then here we come to the leaf, which Patrick Geddes was talking about. 
Leaves are a fairly modern invention. They go back about 360 million years to the early Carboniferous. Um, and they are quite incredible structures. This is from a yew leaf. And you can see it's got these almost lens-like cells up at the top, focusing the, life the light down inside. And it's got these air channels in, in between, making it porous enough for gases to flow in and out. It's an amazingly uh, efficient and effective structure. And the tiny little green dots that you can see, those are the chloroplasts where photosynthesis happens. So those little tiny green things are what have made our planet a place we could live on and can continue to live on. This is a scanning electron microscope picture of a single chloroplast. That's the edge of it there. And inside, it's also efficiently organized for capturing sunlight on these masses of membranes packed in together. That's where the reactions of photosynthesis go on in these stacks of membranes. And it's surrounded by some other structures, um, mitochondria, which are within cells, the factory that breaks down and releases energy. And what's remarkable is that both of those things started out as independent forms of life, uh, very similar to blue-green algae in the case of the chloroplast, and got incorporated into a more complex kind of cell. So we have mitochondria in every one of our cells. Obviously, we haven't got chloroplasts, or else we would be green. And, um, but these were amazing processes of planet Earth becoming more complex in its cell biology. So, oh, sorry, it has it. I don't know why it does that, gets ahead. Um, so to go back to Geddes, he really was right. We do live on a planet that is works only because of the leaves and only because of photosynthesis. Our world is literally powered by plants. And you can think of that either in terms of using fossil fuels, which are just fossil photosynthesis, or food. So it's come on to a second quotation from Geddes, and this is the second of two that I'm going to be showing you. By leaves we live. Some people have strange ideas that they live by money. They think energy is created by the circulation of coins, whereas the world is mainly a vast leaf colony, growing on and forming a leafy soil, not a mere mineral mass. And we live not by the jingling of our coins, but by the fullness of our harvests. I wish I could write this stuff. <laughs> it's wonderfully well written. This is the one chart I have in my talk um, called The Transformation of the Biosphere and produced by Earl Ellis last year. And what it shows is really that um, soon as our ancestors, some 12,000 years ago, started to practice settled agriculture, even before they began that, in fact, the world was changing under human influence. And what this shows at the top is red, uh, densely settled areas of the planet, yellow croplands, orange rangelands, expanding through time and squeezing out the dark green of wildlands and this lighter shade of green of semi-natural land. And a conversion then from 6000 BC, as it's shown here in this chart, through to the year 2000 with that expansion. Particularly, they were emphasizing population growth when Europeans moved into the Americas. But that has been a pattern of how we have taken over uh, the wildlands of the planet and are starting to work it in a quite different way from how it was when we first evolved on it. So Geddes was right. We really do live by the fullness of our harvests. Um, it's fundamental that we are surviving because of plants, photosynthesis, and the energy they produce. And we get most of our calories from a handful of cereal species. Wheat is one of them, rice, maize are the top three things that sustain human life, followed not far behind by things like the potato, barley, and other um, important um, sources of food. And you might be thinking, well, we're not all vegetarian, but don't forget our animals are essentially farmed on leaves. So really, it is true, then, the fullness of the harvests. And that expansion that was shown in the chart of human landscapes replacing wild landscapes in the temperate regions of the world, that progressed so rapidly that even before the Industrial Revolution started in Europe, 
half of the world's forests had already gone up to that point. Tropical forests, on the other hand, um, survived remarkably well at that time and even into the 20th century. The destruction of most of the tropical forests is much more recent, just really in the last few decades. And um, that's a shame because, of course, they're critically important as they're home to 90% of terrestrial species, but also because very often in the tropics, when forests are removed, they're not replaced even with a productive agricultural system. So the replacement of tropical forests often isn't something sustainable that we would want for the future. Now, you very often hear it said that forests are the lungs of the planet, and in a fairly crude way here are some forest lungs. Um, they are, because what they're doing for planet Earth is replenishing the atmosphere. They are driving weather systems, and particularly rainfall, and as a result, they're keeping the rivers flowing, they're allowing soils to build up, and they're playing a huge and important part in the life of the, of the planet that we often forget about and take for granted. And in a world with seven billion of us humans depending on it, uh, we're effectively living on a planet that's running on one lung. And you can run on one lung, you can survive that way, but it's a bit of a stretch. And if you think about it, with seven billion humans, um, in principle, it's often said, though I personally don't believe it, that we do produce enough food to feed everyone on Earth. Personally, I doubt that because you don't see it happening at all. And indeed, at least one billion human beings are what the Food and Agriculture Organization calls undernourished, and which you and I might simply call starving. So we're not doing very well at managing to distribute um, the fullness of our harvests to all of humanity. And on at the Botanics at the moment, there's an exhibition called um, Hard Rain, which goes in a lot of detail to why it is that um, those deprived of food and living in such desperate situations that are you're seeing here, uh, why that's being caused by wars, by famines, by inappropriate market systems that fail, essentially, and have perverse uh, incentives built into them, a whole variety of reasons. But reflecting on Patrick Geddes's words, and if I think back to how he might have seen this, it seems to me that the situation of poverty in many parts of the world is essentially what happens when human beings are separated from or cannot have access to the products of photosynthesis. And you look at the droughts in the background to many of the most terrifying images of humanity you've ever seen. So I find it strange then that we very often talk about the global economic markets as though they were alive. Living entities, you know, questions such as how's the market reacting? What does the market think? Is it a bull or a bear market? Human, uh, sorry, life, life characteristics, life labels. Um, and that seems to be um, very much how we think about the economy of our planet. <coughs> What Geddes reminds us, though, is that, on the other hand, we should, in fact, be asking questions about life, about nature, about photosynthesis. How's it doing? Uh, how's it being managed? There's a lot of emphasis now on, were the banks regulated enough? It's an important question, I don't doubt it. But what about the regulation and care for nature? Every country has its laws to protect the rarest species in the best places, but we're not really thinking at the planetary level about needing enough stock or natural capital of forest, of agricultural productive land, and of green city spaces. So we haven't got that mix right. Um, if we have all the pieces of biodiversity, we can rebuild and put things back. I worked quite a bit in Belize some years ago, and I loved this place because what it showed was, after the collapse of the ancient Mayan civilization in about 600 AD, forests returned, and all the full biodiversity was there. We can rebuild and get back the, um, the forests, even in the tropics. And close to home now in Scotland, I think we're leading and starting to lead in so many different ways. Here's a picture I took in the um, Cairngorms National Park, where just the simple act of putting in a deer fence and stopping overgrazing for a few years has meant that seed trees like these can produce a more or less instant forest. 
Scotland has wonderful targets for more of that in the future, and it has wonderful targets for renewable energy as well. So I think that we're starting really to respond to the situation we find the planet in. And I think, uh, to, to close more or less, what I'd like to suggest is that if we went back to thinking about our one-man enlightenment, Patrick Geddes, and took his wisdom about the planet and uh, understood that by leaves we live, we might actually carry this kind of thing further forward and see that this really is the economy of the planet. So I'm going to close just with the simple test now of um, one of these wonderful uh, planetary objects or space objects has leaves on it. One of them doesn't. And if we paid attention to Patrick Geddes, we'd know that one does still support life and can for the future, and one hasn't supported life and couldn't. Thank you.